I'm Johnny von Wallström. I'm a director and filmmaking coach at LearnDocumentary.com. And today we're going to talk about low-budget filmmaking. And especially documentaries, because that's what I do. Uh, and I mean, that's how I got started. I still prefer to make films that way. My first film, Zero Silence, was such a, an epic success as a low-budget uh, documentary. And the thing is that I was talking to one of the students uh, uh, like some days ago uh, about this, and it's interesting because that film really is a really good way of starting out. And I had a job. I was working with an NGO. I was coming out of like a bankruptcy, so I was like not in a good position in life. And then I had a like a extra job, telemarketing job in the evenings. So I was just like doing that. And then I was starting a new production company. And that led me to like think about like how do I want to make my projects? How do I do them, you know, without money because I didn't have any money. So I started thinking about it while I was doing a project uh, for an NGO or an organization that worked with like a leadership program with uh, bloggers and journalists coming from the Middle East to Sweden and while I was on that program I started meeting a lot of characters and I just felt like their story was amazing and that eventually led to me starting a documentary about those characters and at the moment I was working with you know this project where I was traveling to the Middle East and I had my gear so I was shooting and then I just started making a documentary about some of them and this eventually turned out to be like the Arab Spring. So I was filming the Arab Spring three years before all that happened. And then that was sold to TV and it went to film festivals and it was a huge success. But it was just made with no money and no budget at all. It was just me. I had my Canon 5D Mark II, uh, which was a really good thing because that camera was so small. So when all the other people with big cameras was uh, having problem getting in, you know, in Tahrir Square and uh, just shooting stuff was not easy because there was so many uh, like secret service police officers and all that was just uh, lurking around. And uh, that camera was easy to hide. It was easy to just put in your backpack, get onto Tahrir Square without anybody asking any questions. So we were filming and a lot of the journalists was shut down and they didn't have the opportunity that we had to shoot there because we had the tiny camera and with the 50 millimeter lens on it and just lavalier microphones. And that was pretty much it. Um, and that's the strength in that case. Like that film happened because we were limited in terms of budget and stuff. And uh, that's really what it's all about. Like using... The limitations that you have when it comes to low budget filmmaking you gotta use those to your advantage and that's what you always do but it's forced on you so you become more creative because of that and i think that's the the nicest thing about working with small means is that creativity just like it blossoms out of that so that's not a bad thing to not have any funding um and I mean, that film, it pretty much kick started my career. It sold to TV. I was able to start pitching projects and I started to be able to get like tiny, tiny funds after that. But that film didn't get like it didn't get fully funded. It was a budget of 45,000 or something. But that all that money went to the expenses of traveling in the end to the revolution in uh, Egypt and Tunisia and to cover that on the ground and then to the editor so there was no money left and that's usually what happens uh, but in the sense of like the way it was filmed it was filmed for three years without any money so it was self-funded but the smart thing I did was to just see this NGO uh, thing that I had it was just a project that I had going on it was a long-term project so I was working with the means I had. I knew I had travel to the Middle East covered during those times that I was shooting. So I just added extra days as I was traveling and I shot the documentary on the additional days so I could minimize travel expenses and I could just use my own gear that was there and was rented for me covering the other stuff. And then in the evenings after I was shooting for like all this NGO corporate work, I was trying to 
like interview people when they had time and when there was opportunities for that. So I think that model was really good. And like, if you have a, a project like that, then you should take advantage of it because all the, your research as well, it's minimized because you're uh, you're in an opportunity that you're meeting like good strong characters. Uh, but you know you you don't have to look for them if you've already found them but you have to tell a different story i think than for instance an ngo or something would like to tell it's not often that you find a brand or an ngo that wants to tell the story in the way that it should be told to be a film it's usually just you know propaganda and i get that because it's it's a brand uh, like any ngo or any brand is a brand so they want to uh, serve their agenda whatever that is and for an NGO, that's usually, you know, just promoting how good work they're doing. It's not about telling the best story, but often that's the most impactful thing. So they should do it, but rarely they value it in the same way as, you know, I would. So I think that, like, think about how you can do that on any project. Think how you can use the resources that you're getting on a project. If you have something special and unique that it's worthwhile, you know, pursuing a film. And sometimes you have this long term. I had this for, I guess, a couple of years. I was doing the same project. And it's similar now when I work with Craft Sports, where we're going around traveling um, with athletes. And I see it now as like, okay, we're doing short films, but we're also collecting footage and searching for like other stories within that. And perhaps there's like a feature film coming out of it. You don't know. But you got to stay open to that if you want to be resourceful, because that's what it's pretty much all about, you know. Um, so that's that's like how I got started. And before that, I was doing fiction films and all that has also been uh, like low budget stuff. So I'm, I'm very used to that. I've done a feature. I didn't direct it, but I DP'd it. And that was also a feature length film that went to the cinema and everything that was... Uh, just low budget, super low budget. And it, w- it turned out amazing. We even won like an award in Sweden for best costume, I think. But that was way back, around the same time, actually, that this film was made. Um, so, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. And, and like, in terms of story, I think you, you if you search for a story, you got to think about it in... Because this is what I didn't do. So... <laughs> I made the problem for myself of not acknowledging, you know, the the problem that comes with doing like a time sensitive topic because you want something that blows up like the Arab Spring did and then you have made a film about it. That's perfect. But it also comes with its consequences of a lot of other films at the same time about the Arab Spring. And what's interesting about that and this was a lesson that I brought, you know, to my next coming project after that. You start and you start telling a story and, you know, you have patience and all that. But then when something like that happened, like that of spring, you fear that your film will die out and that all of a sudden, like everybody will make a film about it. And especially TV that we worked with was really worried that that was going to happen. So they really rushed the film out. And while it did premiere at Sheffield Dockfest and it was like this big thing for me and my career and everything it could have been bigger i mean the square came out a year later or so and it was very similar extremely similar so if we would have had the patience to do that it would have had you know the same chances as that one and i think that taught me to do that the next time and that's how i made the pearl of africa for netflix as well because it started as one idea I abandoned that idea because there was another film called Mikuchu that came out that was also Oscar nominated, I think, um, about a similar topic as I was making the film about. So I had to shift the focus. And then I went with a trans story instead of a gay rights issue story. Uh, it was still the same, you know, foundation of the story, but it just, yeah, it switched a little bit so you can have like a fresh perspective and be unique because that's what it's all about. And if you need help developing your story, check out my Doc Heroes cheat sheet because it's free. I think it's what's the URL? Let me think. <laughs> I know what it is, but I forgot it. I made a URL. 
just to be able to say how easy it is. And I cannot even remember it. That's hilarious. LearnDocumentary.com slash DocHero. I know it's that one at least. I'll remember it to the next time. So let me just take some questions. What's your advice on sustaining a full-time job and YouTube success as documentarist? Just want to know your thoughts. Um, if you Are you meaning with a full-time job? You're meaning... Uh, Working with a full-time job on the side that isn't filmmaking or is it filmmaking because it's it's quite separate uh, Things I think for me like Working full-time has always been a, a problem because y you have to go all in on whatever you want to succeed in so let's say you're uh, Wanting to make like YouTube a thing There's so many people doing it that are sitting in their bedroom that are like young living off of mom and dad that can dedicate all their time and energy to it and that's why so many blows up because they focus all their energy and i think that's the big difference in terms of like just embracing the medium that you're doing whatever that is just going all in once you're all in you start to see patterns you start to just become like uh, yourself times 10 times 100 in terms of your capacity just because you're so much better when you're doing something uh, more specifically and i think that's the big issue that i've struggled with when i've done branded things and then i've done youtube and then i've done feature films and then i've done tv series they eat so much time so everything just gets all scattered around that's why i quit youtube the last time around because it it like it ate so much time because if you want to do it right and you want to grow on YouTube, you have to be like very, very consistent and you have to be much more uh, dedicated to understand what works that you're doing and what doesn't. So it goes way beyond just uploading the videos. You really need to like test things out and uh, research things and yeah, just become really savvy at that. And if you want to do that, then to make it happen you need to be consistent so you need to look at like this is the time that i have okay set a plan like wh what can i do with the time that i have what's reasonable in terms of what you can shoot what type of videos can you do i know that i'm developing a lot of stuff right now so live streaming is really easy for me to be consistent with while it's much harder for me to do like the videos like i want to do them so then I decided just to like, oh, I'll do live streaming for a while and just test it out and see what comes of it. And I think that's how you got to think of it. And it's, it's very similar when you look at low budget filmmaking. It comes down to just looking at the resources that you have at the moment. See it as, okay, now I'm starting this project. What do I have? Okay, I have this camera. Uh, I have this mic, whatever it is. You got to work with whatever you have and realize that this is what I have and then I need to be able to finish a film with this. You shouldn't think that you're, oh, I'm going to get this and I'm going to get that. No, just focus on, okay, I have these resources. This is the camera that I have. Okay, and I'm going to finish this in whatever it is. Three years is usually at least what it takes to make a good documentary. So don't expect it to be any faster. So make like a, a plan to go out and shoot that film for that time. And then when you do that with the resources you have, you might end up getting more resources because it takes time to shoot those films and everything. But I think the, the most sustainable way of doing it is just looking at what you have and then just setting, okay, I'm going to do this 15 minutes a day. I'm going to work on this. Or one hour a day. I'm going to work on this. Or seven hours a week. And then you stick to it. Because as soon as you start to like go and leave your uh, you know plan it starts to very fast deteriorate and you won't be progressing at all and i've done that with the zero silence film i just decided that okay 15 minutes a day i'm going to dedicate to this project whatever that was and then you find yourself in a flow and you start to just you start to move quicker and then it becomes easier and then all of a sudden like one hour two hours three hours has gone and you didn't even notice because really the, the hardest thing is starting and that's like 
the only thing you need to do is really start and commit to finishing it, whatever it takes. And that's easier when you're starting with what you have than if you dream big and, you know, you quit. Um, I'm in a rut as I move to a rural area in England and have a lot of responsibility financially to support my wife and kids. Ended up shooting weddings. Yeah, I think it's really lonely to be, you know, uh, if, if you don't have success... Being, you know, in the rural areas and just by yourself and perhaps not having people that you're working with that are doing the same thing and that are creative, that can be super difficult to get through. I have had the opportunity of always being active as I've lived in the countryside. So it's been, it's been very much a blessing instead because I've been able to focus easier. I think that when I was in the city, it was so easy to get caught up in everything in in like the city you get all oh, this call or you get this email to have this meeting and yeah you go to be nice or whatever that's really hard when you live an hour and a half outside of stockholm you don't do it you know to be nice <laughs> then you really you really need to want to do it because it takes at least three hours to get there and back home without that whole thing you know and that's really good it's good for your focus as long as you can like stay mentally healthy and working out does that for me at least so like my structure looks like this i i would usually i get up at like four or five in the morning i work and then my kids get up okay they get up and i make breakfast and then send them off to school sit and work until nine and then at nine between nine and ten ish i go and i work out and then uh get her back and I work and I eat and then uh, I go for a walk with my dog and then I go for more work and then I will usually every other day train another time in the evening and then I mean my kids get home and that's it and those just uh, training uh, that training structure it really resets my brain so that I don't really have an issue with like focusing or having uh, like good mental health and I think all of that comes from that that routine it just saves me because I don't like stick in my mind just thinking about like the negative things because it just clears out as soon as I do that so like that's a that's a tip pro tip uh, work out more uh, attempting to broaden my client base commercial experience but it's hectic with everyday life how do you balance everything finding time to shoot spec ads with a family I think it all comes down to being like very uh, very well organized w with yourself I'm not really like I'm I'm very determined and I'm very focused and like I have a plan but I'm very good also at just having that plan and then all of a sudden this shiny object is here and I'm <laughs> all focused on that. And then I go all in on that for a year or something and that, this just faded away. That is like the ADHD gene. And I mean that's very common that you are like that if you are a creative person. And that is something that you have to like just push away. And that's what I've done now, for instance. I've decided I'm not making a new project. I'm not starting any new project until I've seen that like this YouTube and LearnDocumentary.com uh, project is just flowing. So everything is uh, focused on that. And then I do the Croft Sportswear channel as well. So basically I am a full-time YouTuber, but I do two channels. And like one is for a brand and one is my own. But I only want to focus on that because i have this opportunity of just working on youtube right now and what i notice when you're focused like that is that all energy goes into understanding this platform and you become so much better at it like the craft sportswear channel is is doing really well and that's like my main focus in terms of a channel right now and that's just because you know th that channel is for a brand so it, it becomes the priority but to manage those two things only, it demands a lot of planning. Uh, so I'm going and I'm shooting from time to time with craft and then I'm home and I'm just trying to get as much done as I can. But I also have to edit videos for that channel. So you got to be very well 
planned in terms of uh, when you do those things and when you develop the projects and there is research. So just sticking to a schedule and trying to just organize your yourself as much as you can and, and sticking to like not spending all time doing stuff that yeah it's not necessary so certain things yeah they can get much better but you gotta just drop it and just move on to the next thing to progress as well and i think the the biggest thing when you have a family is really just starting not procrastinating just starting on something and then yeah doing it but it's a, it's a challenge for sure because you you gotta involve them as well like my kids are often here i you can't see it but i've i've built a tree house in the studio for them because they they got so much stuff like they got all kinds of stuff my kids are they're so dirty i don't know everywhere there's stuff so they're going up there in the ceiling they're probably going to think it's fun but i just want to get them out of you know the way and not mess up the studio too much but it's fun because they've been building it with me and like that that sort of thing it it's good because then they are part of my work so they're often here if if i'm working they like just hanging out down here because uh, this is like an old stable uh, great to see you back on a regular base my problem uh, really is the protagonist my plan doc is kind of Oh, the plan, the protagonist of my plan dog kind of suck. Yeah, then, well, let me see. Uh, the, don't say things the way I wish. It's always as if they are bored. So how do you build a great interview setup? Uh, best lighting and then talk shit. Um, I think there's, there's a couple of things going on. I think, first of all, I think that they probably need you to film them more, just hanging out, just becoming a friend for a while. That's usually what it is when people are, you know, super boring or not doing stuff. But then there's also the aspect of you directing it more. So the way that I approach it, and I think uh, two ways, actually, two ways. Uh, one from being a DP, I know like uh, one trick is to just, for instance, in the Pearl of Africa, I had this exact scenario where Cleo and Nelson is just sitting at home not doing anything and they're super bored and like it they're not really talking to each other they're like whisper talking and they're, it's so low in volume and mumbling that like oh, I don't even know how this is going to be used so then you got to think like okay what can I do with them to get them out and to be themselves because oftentimes if they're alone they're have a tendency to be super boring so then bring a friend or a partner or somebody that is like more bringing that stuff that is interesting out of them and with Cleo and Nelson it, it was just a matter of getting them out and I thought okay so let's go up on this mountain and then hopefully there's a nice sunset and then hopefully they will show their love because they weren't showing it at home and then we went up and like Cleo was complaining the whole way up and then all of a sudden, you know, you see a sunset and you get happy. And they start hugging and they start kissing and they start playing around. And, like, that moment is so good. Like, it, it is really the best, like, two, two really good of those, like, love moments in the, in the film, I think. And I think that's what directing a documentary is all about. Seeing those scenes that can show that. Like if if you want to tell a story about love, you gotta think about which scenes could show that, and then you need to just make those scenes happen with them. And if you're making a story on a low budget, this becomes even more important because that's all you have really to make it cinematic is just think up these scenes where this could happen that could bring like not only like production quality, which it also does, but also it brings a cinematic quality that most people don't have because i mean most people don't have money for making docs it's super low budget like a, a low budget doc in the first place it's probably around like five hundred thousand dollars is like the high end of it but it goes down so low like i guess most people would be in the 10k range or something 10k to 25k it's probably a normal low budget doc 
but of course most people make them with what they have in terms of gear and yeah all that stuff but then another directing thing that that i learned from a director i worked with as a dp that i've taken to heart it's it's a really good way of working it's like you have a Okay, so you can do an interview, right? You can see in an interview, they're super boring. All interviews are so boring. But it's really good to do the interviews because it's so much easier to edit in the editing room. So I do interviews all the time. But I hope that I get them in another way. And that's by having two people talk with each other. So let's say you have, like, character one is your main protagonist and then you have another one. So instead of you asking questions, you tell the other person that they're hanging out with to ask the question whatever that is okay so how was your day at work because then that starts a conversation in between them and then you can direct what way you want that conversation to go by throwing that question out in you know their room and then that creates a much more cinematic film as well because that's really what what you want you want them to converse and you want them to just you know be themselves in that scenario uh, and that's like one of the key things as well to get them just to move but then it's also bringing the right character into the mix so picking that friend that is eccentric and that they're laughing with like oftentimes you can see when you hang out and you put the camera off how are they then if they're funny then or if you know stuff happens then that is something that you should be able to get out of them and that comes down to you as a director to do that and then you just gotta think of ways to to get them to be the same way like in what scenarios are they the most uh, eccentric try to get those to happen um, something is rustling on the mic that's weird it's up here is it me that's too loud? I don't know. Let me know if it goes away. Maybe it's just a stream. Have you always worked solo? Do you have... Or have you always worked solo? Or do you find having a business partner helpful? No, I work with... Like my brother and I have the production company that we have together. But I live out here and he lives in Stockholm. He used to live in Berlin as well. So we've always been like in different places. And we usually work with freelance people all over the world. So sometimes it, it depends on where we are. So for instance, if we would do a TV show, then most people would be based in Stockholm and they would work at the television station or at our office in Stockholm. But I'm never in the office in Stockholm. I'm always here. So... I prefer working here because I'm more effective and I don't know. I, I just want to tell stories. I don't want to run a business. So that's what, <laughs> that's just what I prefer. And it, of course, in the traditional system, it, it, it go, they go crazy because I'm so not like I'm not interested in being there while they live that way. Like it's all about living in Stockholm in my context. Um, but I prefer it. I prefer to make films myself. And I've noticed something recently over the years when I've collaborated so much. Like the productions that we've done. We've been five editors on most of the TV shows that I've done. And then we've been like two editors, I guess, on most feature films the recent years. And I've just noticed that I think myself at least that I tell the best story when I do everything myself because I feel like as soon as somebody else is involved for instance in the conversations with the protagonist like my brother produces it so oftentimes he will have a lot of the conversation but he isn't an expert in doing interviews and talking to people as I am because I worked for 20 years and he has probably worked 10 years or so so I I've done so many interviews over the years and I've spent so much time with protagonists that I've learned so much about like getting them comfortable and all that. But a lot of that has gone away when productions scaled up and I think that's bad because the relationship that you have is really like it's a big thing in, in how the films are made and there's been so much I think complications from that and there's a lot of those things like that comes with doing bigger productions that is just like 
the DPs that we use for a TV series, for instance, they were really good, but that doesn't mean that they are perfect for that project. So it was a struggle on one uh, TV show that we did to get like the DPs to shoot the scenes that we wanted to shoot. Like the footage looked really great, but we didn't capture the stuff that we wanted to capture in terms of authentic moments. So that was a lot of struggle to, uh, compared to when I shoot myself, for instance. I know that it's exactly as I want it. And yeah, I might not be the greatest DP in the world, but I'm also very good. So it's enough. And just knowing that I'm good enough to make the story, it, it creates like this ownership and authenticity and like perspective in the story that I think most films today lack that you don't have this single vision you have so many so many people in the story that it becomes you know soulless and that's really what you can gain from doing low budget filmmaking you can really get like so much more authenticity you can get so much more uh, of all the good stuff that you will lose as productions become more expensive in terms of like how intimate everything is how much you can control the the story like uh, good and bad i mean if you're a bad storyteller then that can be really bad but you also learn from making the mistakes and being a bad storyteller and you probably need to go through that to become a good storyteller and you just gotta see things in the positive way i think either way uh, but I like it. I, I really think that the smaller the team, the better. I, I don't think that it's a benefit of being like a big team, a lot of gear. It just slows you down. I rarely... like I, If I could choose, I would work with a, an, a gaffer and me most of the time. Because that would just make it so that I could uh, enhance the cinematic qualities that I don't have time for. It's not that I can't, you know, control the lighting and all those things, but I don't have time because I, I sit on too many roles in the productions. So it just, yeah, it becomes something that I don't care so much about, even though like I, I would like to. But yeah, it's hard to put the funds towards a gaffer in a documentary production. But yeah, I rarely use a sound technician or anything. I do that myself. But you got to teach yourself to do everything on a professional level so that you are... Like I could work as a sound technician easily. I could have sound mixed, for instance. The last TV show that I did, I didn't tell anyone, so don't tell anyone. But I sound mixed the whole show. It was a primetime show. Four, four parts. Like I taught myself that to be able to do it because I just wanted to. I just thought it was fun. Um, and just having that mindset is really beneficial when you do low budget stuff because once you know it like I know it now I've, that's how I learned grading it's how I learned editing it's how I learned uh, cinematography I just did it and then w once you can do it you do it forever like motion graphics all those things is, is really time consuming to learn but once you know it it's easy it's also for the Pearl of Africa I taught myself how to make the music for that I didn't do all the music i had some tracks that i licensed but then i did all the all the atmospheres i did and that was just from you know the rights being a problem and i did the animations and like yeah just have that mindset when you do the low budget docs and it's so much easier long term if you just have that approach um let's see oh it's my jacket it's the beard God damn it. And I put this on. I had another shirt, but I can't strip right now. Maybe next time. Okay, so how did you end up shooting and editing the running YouTube channel? So I've been working with um, Craft on, I can't remember, but I've done a couple of, uh, of docs, like doc style commercials for them. I don't know if it's like two maybe. No, actually, I, I worked with one of them that went to uh, to Craft to work as a marketing director there. I actually worked with him on a different project before when he worked at a different agency. And then he moved on to there. And then he brought us in to do a project which was um, just like a regular type of advertisement. And then I guess we started talking about 
YouTube because I was doing YouTube at the time and then eventually uh, they came to us wanting to do like a short film about Tommy Rives. He was supposed to run through all of Sweden and then uh, that whole thing fell apart because he got cancer and that project was started and was supposed to be a short film and then like eventually they wanted to do a feature film about it and that started to build this whole relationship and we embarked on that journey and then from that the youtube channel id was pitched to them i guess i don't remember but i think we pitched it to them and then they liked it and then we started doing that and i think now it's like the the thing that i want to do i want to do that more uh, right now it's to focus on that channel and my channel but eventually I want to scale that up to do it with more brands and with freelancers because I don't have time to do more but I would like to uh, do similar things for other brands but on a more like an agency level but that's a long term thing so maybe at the end of the year or something I'll get to that um, but I think that's like a, a dream project for me especially that likes being outdoors and running so it, it's uh, perfect for me I think that's why you get most jobs you get that way and uh, it's really fun because it's low budget like they don't uh, have time when it's low budget so low budget filmmaking has that, uh, that advantage that they can't be involved in everything so the shorts that I get to do on that channel it's like doing low budget docs long term without having a client that really has time to be part of it and then it's perfect that's what you get from doing low budget stuff and youtube is that because nobody prioritizes that they have their ads that they're doing and they invest you know big budgets in that on that one-off thing in this they invest a bigger budget for a year but they don't have time because they have all the other stuff they have to do so it's like a perfect scenario if you're a filmmaker to to have a deal like that and the way it works for us is we have a year at a time so first we did like development of okay how do we launch this channel which keywords do we focus on like doing all the analytical stuff um and of course i learned that because i've been a youtuber for a while so i know all about like how you grow a youtube channel so now we implemented that on their channel but then the nice thing about working with a brand is that they also put advertising money on top of that uh, to the videos so it's much quicker to grow but you just gotta nail like okay which audience are you targeting because at first it was like like a regular commercial thing it would maybe get like 20 or 30 second retention and then all the brands they will think that that's what you can get but then like we know that you can get much more than that and now i think we're up to like almost five minutes retention or something on that channel and for brands that's unheard of like it's so good for them and you can just imagine the relationship it builds to their audience and all that so that's the the really important factor of getting the ads as well to be the uh, same type of retention so it's people actually wanting to see the films that's what yeah was new to us but now yeah we're nailing that as well but i think branded docs is really a great opportunity and with youtube and now when like you're in a financial uh, struggle for a lot of companies it's a perfect opportunity to like work with brands that want to invest in smaller creators and like try new ideas for how they market stuff like best year ever i think to push all your time and energy into something like that um how many years has it been for you in this career i guess 20 how long at least 21 22 something like that um i mean if you look at it from the beginning the first film that i did was for, for a friend and i guess a lot of people would start this way I think the budget was 2000, I think so. And it was like, I was at uh, the university at the time. So I was working 
while I was in the university, I was doing freelance type of uh, marketing stuff, um, websites and yeah, videos for some, so my friend. And then I was teaching also, while I was in school, I was teaching uh, compositing, which is basically what you do in After Effects. Uh, compositing and editing I was teaching at the university as well. So that's like in the beginning, I was just struggling with that. And then we went to Stockholm, like this was in Gävle, which is north of Stockholm. Then we went to Stockholm to start, very ambitiously, we wanted to start an ad agency. <laughs> and that did not go well. So I started studying uh, photography and then film production two more years. But during that time I was also freelancing. And then I started a production company when I came out of the film school. And uh, we did like hustle with that type of jobs, like twenty, th like two thousand to two thousand five hundred type of projects. Like if we got five thousand, it was good. Then we did that for a while, and then I think with zero silence, I wonder if the budgets went up. I guess probably went up to like ten k then, ten k and fifteen k that range, and then. Like it slowly progressed. Then when the Pearl of Africa came out, I think the budgets probably went up to like 50k or, or something. And then like from that it's moved on to like much bigger budgets. But that's how like the use of a low budget film is not just like the film and all that. It's, it's also like the springboard for your career. Because it creates PR, it creates like a style that they like and that they pair with IDs they have. So for instance, the way agencies think is that they like put you in a box, okay, he makes this type of films. And then if you've made a film that looks a certain way, then you'll get jobs that are that way. So that's how I've used it to like just raise my career. And now it's like, I guess with craft, it's, it's, uh, it's like a big budget per year. And then from that, like it's a retainer every year. So it, it's a long term project. But it's like having a budget for a low budget feature film, I guess, a year. Um, yeah, but it's really good. It, it makes it possible for us to be much more free in what we do. So I prefer that much more than working with television and doing ads and all that stuff because it's like this base that, yeah, it frees up my time and I can just focus on. When I have to do those videos, I can just focus on doing those and those are really fun to make. And then when I have done those, I can move and work on my projects and then focus on that. That's ideal to have that. And when I work telemarketing in the evenings, uh, when I was recovering from a bankruptcy, that was also great because it was like this focused work when my mind was not creative. So that kind of was easy to make money that way and then just go home and work on the creative stuff because it was separate. So there's a benefit in that as well. Um, am I th right in thinking you're creating docs for a running channel manufacturer? How did that opportunity develop from a commercial point of view? Uh, yeah, I told you that. Um, so earning... They're targeting specific audiences via paid campaigns on their channel videos. So do you run short form ads linking to... No, actually the way that it works, which I think works really well, is that uh, it's my brother that does most of the marketing. So I'm not 100% into it. But I know that it, it works this way because I'm doing ads for Learn Documentary myself. So you would put like an ad you would there's a lot of ways to, to do the advertising but of course you choose like your target group and you you place the ads but the thing that's worked the best for the craft sportswear channel is to have it sponsored like a, a regular video and then you notice straight away if it's a high converting video meaning that if it for instance gets high retention or if it gets a lot of subscribers and we've chosen to go on the ones that have like the biggest interactions and, and subscribers so those videos we will put ads on and then they would get sponsored and like some of them might rank but usually we would do it as like okay this video it has its run like uh, at some point it flattens out and when it flattens out that's when we run the ad campaign 
because we don't want to mess with it. I don't know if it has a, an effect, but I think it does. I think you you probably want to see like how much does it do organically first. So we let it go organically and then when it flattens out, we put ads on it and then it takes off again. And then it usually is like if you pick the good videos that you're making and you put ads on it, it does generate some subscribers, but it's not like you can grow a channel if you're not a brand that's making a lot of money because they are brand building. That's their focus. So they think it's good. But if I would do it, for instance, on Learn Documentary, I would do it for uh, videos, for instance, that are uh, converting to sales because it doesn't make sense to, to just pay for branding in my case. Uh, or I don't think it does. But I think that's how most people do ads. So they, they will do ads to br build the brand and that's how we have done it previously. But I think that it's a better strategy if you can to have like the advertising that you do, you focus on it being uh, tied to an offer that you have, uh, whatever that is. For me, it's courses or it's mentorship program or, or whatever it is. Uh, so for instance, if, if you take like my Netflix uh, documentary mastery course, if that is a thing that I uh, like make a video for and I do the advertising for it, it can convert to a sale and I can justify why I'm doing the ads so I can spend more money on ads and I can grow the channel more because I'm generating money as I'm building the brand. That's the ideal way of working with it. But the Croft thinks uh, that brand in itself, like that branding part, is worth so much that they put just money on. Uh, getting subscribers and everything but th that's just a tip if you want to long term make it sustainable i think that you should tie it to selling also because we used to do it like that and <laughs> doesn't give you much like it's better to focus on organically getting good at what you do in otherwise like if you can uh so let me take some more let's see uh, something uh, for craft are you doing all the creative concept development of their marketing manager or both of you together no basically we have like oh it's so informal <laughs> we would have for instance in uh, UTMB in uh, Chamonix in France last fall we were drinking a beer and talking about like what videos are we gonna do next year and then we talk about that and we have like this very informal uh, business meeting deciding on okay these films would be really good <laughs> to do and then we do that and then that sort of it evolves during the year because they're um, like their their athletes don't know what races they're gonna be at so it shifts a bit and something happens somebody gets injured so you have to go with the flow anyways but what we plan is basically okay these trips are what we're gonna make the big stories around and that like the suggestions doesn't just come from you know thin air during the year when we've been shooting we know basically what stories would be interesting to shoot what are the most like th interesting things that we can think of we know those already because we've spent so much time with everybody so recently my brother went to the u.s to shoot arlen glick for instance um in a prison and uh, where he's having sermons and touring with his family and singing and yeah it's a nice athlete story that nobody would would think of doing and that's what i like like we try to find those like nice type of angles within it uh, this last video it was focused on a race but some stories we want to do that isn't races so yeah that's basically how it works and then we try to make it as productive as we can so we try to think of it in like a way of being more formats like you would for television rather than just making like short docs that are new every time we try to make it more of like a reoccurring theme so it becomes easier to come up with the ideas because otherwise it, you can just spend so much time coming up with different ideas it won't be sustainable that way as a small filmmaker, is it worthwhile splitting commercial doc work away from less desirable weddings? Do commercial clients and brands frown on creative still in the wedding space? I guess some would do, but I think that the hard part about commercial stuff is that 
it's so much tied to who you're hanging out with. Like if, if you hang out with the creatives that are giving you jobs, then you will get the jobs. And that's the thing that I've noticed as well since I stopped doing a lot of ads. I, I don't get asked to do many anymore. So you got to be part of that click to be able to get invited to do them. And I guess that's the big thing when you're doing weddings, you're not in that environment where you're meeting them all the time because you're not on top of mind when they think of somebody. And I think that's the, the real uh, secret to be successful there. Uh, just the networking part is so important. It's, it's a massive thing. And especially when you're starting out. Like I can only live out here and be really annoying to people because I've already established myself. It would not be possible if I was just starting out. Then I would have to be you know, in the city and doing all the dog shit work that you got to do to establish yourself. But now I don't really have to want to. So you just got to do that until you can uh, dictate how you want to do stuff. But it's really important to do your passion projects uh, on a low budget way so that you have the uh, like authorship of those projects because then you can get other jobs that are more in line with that rather than you know just doing everything that everybody else does. Um, let me see some last ones. This is more familiar over there that one we covered. Uh, have you tried the new blazer morphic lenses no they're the first one i see that have actual character i've not heard of those even blazer morphic lenses let me check them out that's good mirage is it this one no, I got blazers for women. <laughs> Is that what they're called? Blazer morphic lenses. That's brilliant. Lenses. Oh, okay. No, it's nanomorph. Budget anamorphic videos we all wanted. Here we go. Oh, commercial. I'm not logged in. Damn it. Okay, I'll check them out later. No, I haven't seen them. Thank you for the tip. Uh, that's great. Blazer Remus. Okay. Um, yeah, so let me know like, f what are stuff that you've done in terms of like low-budget filmmaking. Let me know in the comments and everything. And uh, then I'm going to do a new Q&A next week, I guess. But let me know what type of uh, low-budget experiences you have because it's interesting to to just know from others what you've been through it, it's funny because most of the stuff that people say i just realized that yeah i've done that too yeah that's what you you forget about things it's nice to be reminded so comment let me know um otherwise this is uh, something that i'm going to try doing every week I guess I'm going to shoot with Croft soon, so maybe not that week. Or perhaps on the phone. But this is what it looks like, my remote, for the live stream. So, bye-bye. See you next time.